The Originist Controversies were a series of theological struggles between Christian leaders related to the writings of Origen of Alexandria. They ultimately culminated in Origen's anathematization by the Second Council of Constantinople in 553. But to understand why Origen became so controversial centuries after his death, some context is needed. First, towards the end of Origen's ministry in Alexandria, his bishop Demetrius refused to ordain him. After Origen left Alexandria and was ordained in Caesarea, Demetrius claimed that Origen was unsuitable for the priesthood for various reasons. Among them, the claims that Origen had castrated himself, and that he had taught salvation might even be extended to Satan. While Demetrius's petition was dismissed, a record of his accusations remained. Second, Origen's ascetic lifestyle and contemplative theology made him a favorite of monastic communities. This resulted in a new generation of Christian writers deeply influenced by Origen, who considered themselves Originists, such as Evagrius Ponticus. Third, after the conversion of Constantine, many Christians who had suffered for their Christianity at the hands of the Empire were now distrustful of this new, imperial Christianity with its various perks and privileges. This led to the monastic reaction. In the words of Justo L. Gonzalez, it was a massive exodus of the most devout Christians into the deserts to lead a life of meditation and asceticism. This allowed many monastic communities to distance themselves from the corruption they perceived in the church. However, some communities became more violent and unorthodox, like the Donatists. Fourth, as the church rapidly grew and became an official religion, church leadership underwent a similar change from an informal network of Christian leaders to an official hierarchy similar to the state. Accordingly, the authority of the bishops expanded. While earlier a bishop's authority was mostly limited to a small area or city, by the 4th century several bishops of capital cities also functioned as bishops over the entire province. However, I don't want anyone to get the wrong idea. This doesn't mean that previously all bishops were functionally equal. In fact, we know a select few bishoprics were recognized as possessing spiritual authority which extended well beyond their territory. With all this in mind, you can start to understand why bishops sought to gain ecclesial authority over monastic communities and why these communities would resist. I will now try my best to cover the details for those interested, but it's a lot of information really fast. 394. A fight breaks out between the Bishop of Cyprus, Epiphanius of Salamis, and Bishop John of Jerusalem. Epiphanius, a long critic of Origen, accuses John of Originism. John claims that Epiphanius ordained Paulinian within John's jurisdiction. Rufinus of Aquileia defends John. John seeks the support of Theophilus, Bishop of Alexandria. Theophilus, who is fond of Origen, sends Isidore to mediate. However, Isidore is far from neutral and abuses his authority to support John. Jerome, the brother of Polinian and friend of Rufinus, angered by Isidore's actions, accuses his old friend Rufinus of bribery and John of using Polinian's ordination to distract from the matters at hand. Tensions cool, and they reconcile, until Jerome learns Rufinus is translating Origen's works into Latin, leading Jerome to launch another series of accusations and insults at his former friend. The two former monastic friends trade barbs and accuse one another of intentionally misrepresenting Origen. Meanwhile, in Egypt, Isidore returns to Alexandria. Theophilus campaigns for Isidore to become the Bishop of Constantinople, but in 397, John Chrysostom is chosen instead. Meanwhile, Theophilus is also having some issues with local monks. There is some sort of theological disagreement leading to some monks being accused of being simplistic and idolatrous. In other words, reading scripture too literally. The controversy appears to revolve around whether or not fallen humanity retains the image of God, and to what degree human analogies are appropriate when speaking of God. Theophilus, Evagrius Ponticus, and the Tall Brothers are all on the side of that anthropomorphic language is more confusing than helpful and could lead to idolatry. However, according to John Cashin, theirs was actually the minority position in Alexandria. Then something occurs, and Isidore flees to Mount Nitria for sanctuary. He is taken in by the Tall Brothers, four Nitrian monks and former leaders within the Alexandrian church, who are said to have violently rejected church offices and left for the wilderness because of the corruption they saw in the city. According to legend, Ammonius, on being urged to enter upon the episcopal office, cut off his own right ear, that by mutilation of his person he might disqualify himself for ordination. So what happened? Well, 
Isidore claims that he refused to hand money intended for the poor over to Theophilus' church building project. However, Theophilus accuses Isidore of sodomizing a youth a decade earlier. The alleged victim is actually set to testify when the victim's mother appears claiming that her son's testimony has been bought by Theophilus. Theophilus then claims the boy and the mother are pagans with a grudge against him, and that the mother really had previously brought a charge against Isidore, but that Isidore used church connections to buy her silence. Regardless, Theophilus condemns Isidore in absentia. The tall brothers attempt to intercede for Isidore, but Ammonius is struck and arrested. The other brothers then turn themselves in, and Theophilus, feeling the social pressure for arresting such popular monks, releases them. 399. Theophilus delivers his festal letter, promoting the incorporeality of God and attacking the simplistic interpretation that God has literal human appendages. This leads to monks rioting in the city. The monk, Apho of Oxyrhynchus, believing Theophilus' understanding of the Imago Dei to be flawed, successfully seeks him out for correction, and Theophilus actually receives this, writing retractions and blaming his misunderstanding on the devil and the teachings of the originists like the Tall Brothers. Theophilus starts gathering support from other bishops for a campaign to drive this heresy out of the desert. However, the Palestinian bishops contended that they had never heard of these Origenist teachings. As Elizabeth Clark notes, this was either because Origenism was not nearly so far flung in its reach as Theophilus had feared, or that the Palestinian bishops were discreetly refusing to lend him any ammunition for his anti-Origenist cause. While Rufinus had previously successfully petitioned the Bishop of Rome, Pope Sirius, for support, Sirius' successor, Pope Anastasius, says he doesn't know who Origen is and doesn't want to either, and condemns Origen. In 400, at a synod in Alexandria, Origen is condemned, but as E.M. Harding notes, the list of offenses targeted primarily those teachings associated with Vigris Ponticus, rather than the writings of Origen himself. In the resulting purge, 300 monks are forced to flee, but this condemnation is far from universally accepted, and many of the monks find sanctuary in territories of sympathetic bishops. The Tall Brothers and Isidore find sanctuary under John Chrysostom of Constantinople. Following this controversy, Apho is promoted to bishop by Theophilus. Theophilus is summoned to answer for his treatment of the Tall Brothers at the Synod of Oak, but Theophilus, accompanied by Cyril of Alexandria, successfully turns the trial around and puts Chrysostom on trial, resulting in his deposition and exile. Theophilus resumes reading Origen, saying, One could pluck the beautiful flowers and step over the thorny ones, and makes amends with the Originist monks. Origen's teachings on free will will later be used by the Pelagians, which would land him on the wrong side of Augustine, and subsequently, more of the Latin tradition. As you can see, the difficulty with understanding the condemnation of Origen is that it is so tied up in church politics. The reality is, while there were some who were legitimately concerned about the potential heretical influence of Origen, there were also opportunists who were willing to exploit the controversy for personal benefit. So, what was Origen being condemned for? Often modern commentators will frame Origen's condemnation as resulting from his supposed universalism, but this is misleading. While it's true that many criticized Origen's apocatastasis, this was usually because they believed that Origen taught that salvation might even be extended to Satan, something that Origen himself explicitly denied. That said, even this was not the focus of their attacks. Rather, while there's some variance, the common focuses were on subordinationism, Origen's allegorical reading of scripture, and its implications for the soul and body, such as whether man's corporeality was the result of the fall, and if the final resurrection would be to an embodied life. And of all these, subordinationism got the most attention, which makes sense given the Christological debates and heresy that dominated these centuries. However, this isn't even what Origen would be anathematized for. 537. Emperor Justinian conquers the Italian peninsula in his war with the Ostrogoths. Given Pope Silvius's ties to the Goths, he was deposed and replaced by Vigilius, the former chosen successor of Pope Boniface II, former papal delegate to the emperor and ally of Empress Theodora. A conflict is broken out between an originist monastic community and another originist monastic community. It regards the pre-existence of souls and whether or not Christ's soul is like ours. According to Harding, the Protoxistoi were accused of affirming and elevating a created soul of Jesus into the Trinity as a fourth person of the Godhead. The Isochristoi were largely seen as scandalously reducing Christ to the ranks of the created souls. 
543. The Protoctistoi petitioned the emperor for help through a papal delegate, Pelagius of Rome. Pelagius and Minas, the Patriarch of Constantinople, compile evidence of this originous heresy and present it to Justinian. After holding a local synod, Justinian issues an edict, which he sends to the Pope and Patriarchs to obtain their support. The edict condemns the Isochristoi for their belief in the pre-existence of the soul and Origen as their leader, instructing that his works are to be burned. The edict provides examples of Origen's heresy, however, these examples are misattributed to Origen and are actually from Evagrius Ponticus. 545. Pope Vigilius is not condemning things just because the emperor tells him to. After refusing to buckle on the Chalcedonian controversy and the Three Chapters controversy, Justinian has the pope transferred to Constantinople so he can keep an eye on him. 553. Justinian and the Patriarch of Constantinople, Eutychius, convoke the Fifth Ecumenical Council, the Second Council of Constantinople, to deal with the various theological problems plaguing the empire. Vigilius refuses to participate. We don't have all the documents, but at the council there does not appear to be any debate regarding Origen, just rather a simple ratification of Justinian's earlier edict. Aftermath. Later that year, Vigilius is finally acknowledges and affirms the council, allowing him to return to Rome, ending his eight-year imprisonment. He dies during the journey, and is replaced by Pelagius of Rome. Despite papal support for the council, several western bishops refused to acknowledge the council because of the condemnation of the three chapters, leading to a schism which took almost two centuries to fully heal. Hopefully by this point it is clear why Origen's condemnation is controversial. The events that led to his condemnation were riddled with human error, petty feuds, and political opportunism. That said, objectionable practices in of themselves do not invalidate a person's position nor do conflicts of interest necessarily refute the sincerity of someone's convictions. Ultimately, Origen and his works were caught up in the theological battles of another time, and the validity of Origen's condemnation is dependent upon how faithful a student Evagrius Ponticus was to his teachings. This has been Ross von Haas and its Saints and Stuff. Hopefully you enjoyed this deep dive into Origen's condemnation. Feel free to like or share your thoughts.